Welcome to Rave Leader Chat, week three for the book of Hebrews, coinciding with uh, Hebrews chapter three. I want to say first a word of thanks to you for your continued leadership in the rave groups. Uh, the session had an opportunity this week to meet with uh, one of the consultants from the group that does the reveal survey. And it once again just reminded us of uh, the amazing things that God has done uh, through our congregation and through our small groups. And you were an integral part of that. And so I just want to say thanks again for your continued leadership and your prayerful preparation uh, as we seek to lead people closer to the Lord and to discover his word. So thank you for all that you do. I want to just quick remind you, we were pursuing well-rounded discipleship, those six marks. Uh, and so kind of continue to keep those in mind and keep those in front of folks so that they might be reminded of that. Now let's turn our attention to Hebrews chapter three. Uh, Hebrews chapter three uh, sort of closes that first section of one and two, a comparison specifically to uh, sort of to the angels and to God's partially revealed word that Jesus is greater than all that. And then we ended with that warning. Uh, now we turn to chapter three and four, uh, which begins a different comparison and a, a different thing. And so it starts with, therefore, in, uh, in light of everything that happened in chapter one and chapter two, there's this progressive argument being made uh, for the impact of the greaterness of Jesus and what that really means for us. And so uh, they get out of the blocks and they, and they say, therefore, and notice how it, it's an interesting question. How are Christians defined in here? And Christians are defined uh, holy brothers and sisters. And again, it's not unlike Paul's use of the saints. Um, there, we've been claimed by God's grace. We've been made righteous by the blood of the Lamb, and therefore we are holy uh, brothers and sisters. We share a heavenly calling. And then there's sort of this again a, a, a light admonition or an instruction. Uh, consider Jesus. The root word for consider there really means, it's a compound word, it really means to diligently apply one's mind to. It's not a brief consideration, it's really consider the fullness of who this Jesus is. And then we are sort of prompted with what to consider. Uh, consider Jesus, who's the apostle, only time in the New Testament where the word apostles applies to Jesus. For us, we oftentimes think of apostle as the 12 apostles, but the word apostle really means sent ones, or here, the sent one. And so it means the incarnate one, the, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, as the Father, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Jesus is the archetype of discipleship. He's the archetype of sentness, of, of the sent. So he's the highest example, and he's the source of all apostleship, of all Christian sending. And so you already have this, like, consider who he is in this radically different way. And then there's, again, this reminder of the high priest. Now, um, it follows right on the end of that, that this comparison to Moses. So you, you have this introduction of Jesus as these two different roles, and now this comparison of Moses, uh, who is, Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him, or him who sent him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Well, a couple things are going on here. One is, the uh, sort of the most sent one in the Old Testament was Moses. God called him. God sent him to talk to Pharaoh. God, he was a, a great servant in the Old Testament. And so as the, these, this language is being added, the, the sent one of the Old Testament really seems Moses could fit that description pretty well. Um, but Moses isn't sent one and high priest. In fact, his brother Aaron would be the initial high priest. And later we're going to understand that he's a high priest of a lower order than the high priesthood that Jesus carries. And so you've got this, now the comparison is that, yes, Moses was great, but Jesus is even greater. And remember, these are Hebrew, uh, these are Jewish Christians who had know their Old Testament and they know these stories, they, they know who Moses is and all that he did. Um, and so you, you have sort of a nod here to Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, uh, which says, and Moses was a faithful servant in God's house. And so uh, the author wants to press how much greater, and he says he, it's, he's greater is the one who uh, built the house, is the, the one who uh, has the house. So he, he's the one, uh, had, much more glory is the builder of the house has an honor of the house itself. So he's the one who created all things that we talked about uh, in the last couple of weeks. And now he's, we need to see that Moses may have tended part of the house, 
but he's part of the created order and Jesus isn't. And then you get a very, in chapter verses four and five, and question two in your study guide is great to this, the opening. Uh, the, the questions in the study guide this week are particularly strong. But question two really focuses on this, this comparison between Jesus and Moses. And uh, verses four and five uh, really sort of bring that. Uh, Moses was a steward. Jesus is the son. Moses is in God's house. Jesus is over God's house. Uh, Moses was going to speak of things to come. So he has a partial and a provisional uh, word about the things that would come. Jesus is the fullest revelation. He's the final word. And so you really have this, this pretty staccato, uh, very quick, rapid fire comparison to sort of say, yeah, Moses was great. Jesus is even greater. Notice it doesn't deny Moses' greatness. And so you've got that uh, great stuff to unpack in verse 4 and 5. And then verse 6 sort of wraps it up, that Christ is faithful over God's house. And there's a good question in your study guide about God's house. I think it's the opening of question 3. Uh, God's house, oftentimes people sort of took that to be the temple, but really it, it's this larger congregation, uh, this group of people who God is building. And then that gets uh, teased out much more fully in the New Testament. And... Uh, and then you get this, again, sort of this reminder. We were asked at the beginning to consider Jesus Christ more fully. And then you get this reminder that we are his house if we hold fast, if we cling to our confidence uh, in who he is and our boasting about our hope in him. And so it's a, a good reminder. And we oftentimes think, well, that's a very Old Testament conception. But in John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you truly are my disciples. Um, there's this uh, continued aspect and responsibility of the people of faith to draw near and to be reminded and to let God's word wash over us. I oftentimes say we can uh, we can't outpace what the Holy Spirit wants to do in, in raising us up and and uh, sanctifying us, making us more in Christ likeness, but we can certainly slow it down. And so that's really what's being said here is that we need to participate in that. Part of the way that we uh, can lose our identity or, or drift, as was warned in the last passage, is by not tending and not doing our part in this process of growing and being shaped uh, more and more into Christ likeness and particularly through his, his word and revelation. So that kind of closes that first section, verses one through six, sort of on the comparison of Moses uh, and Jesus. And then we sort of move to this extended quotation of Psalm 95 in verses 7 through 11. Uh, and what we see here is sort of a, the, the depth of the Old Testament uh, knowledge that is needed to understand this more completely. Uh, we, we have this discussion of the people putting God to the test and missing out on a promised rest uh, and so that's not only an extended quote from Psalm 95, but Psalm 95 really is describing a specific incident that took place in Exodus chapter 17. Uh, the people are wandering in the wilderness after all that they've seen, and they uh, are wondering, is God even with us anymore? Regardless of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, regardless of all the other ways that he's acted on their behalf, they now wonder, is he even here? Manna every day, still not enough. Uh, and they want water, and so they kind of they put God to the test. And this begins the process by which uh, a lot of the, the people uh, in that wilderness wandering will not make it into the promised land. So you've got this, this Old Testament example recorded in the Psalms, re reverting back to Exodus chapter 17, of hardened hearts and rebellion that prevent people from entering into God's promised rest. Now, the opening of chapter 7 says, uh, therefore, the Holy Spirit is said. And we oftentimes look to that to say, okay, well, that this is what the Holy Spirit said. But notice the Holy Spirit's being referred to here as the one who is bringing this God's word to life. And then it, it sort of leads us to sort of keep that. Now that the Holy Spirit has spoken these words of a, a, a truism, an affirmation that we, there's this aspect of the faith that we need to continue to tend, continue to make choices between faithfulness and unfaithfulness of keeping our heart in tune with Christ or, or with God or hardening our heart and choosing rebellion, um, then you get, again, sort of a, a re renewed warning. So verse 12, uh, you get the warning. So take care, brothers and sisters, 
uh, lest there be any evil unbelieving hearts. And really the, the best literal translation there is an evil heart of unbelief. Um, it's an unbelieving heart that leads you to fall away. And really that's the picture that we got in that psalm that re reverted back to Exodus 17, is that the people had ample experience. We we're oftentimes prone to say, well, when we hear this, well, that must mean that they, they didn't understand who God is and what God has done. But notice the context, the people have seen They've been delivered, and yet they are beginning, they lose sight of uh, who God is, of how God's presence, of God's provision, and that begins to affect their hearts of faith in a way that they wonder, is God even real? Is God even with us? Um, maybe I should look to other things. And so you've uh, got this, this re reminder in 12 of not only this process, um, but then you have this... Uh, sort of what to do about it, what to sort of how to take care of it. And it's to exhort one another every day, um, to encourage one another to, to consider the fullness of Jesus and to look at the fullness of the evidence and say, look what God has done. Um, and notice that it's consider, it's encourage one another. It means that there's not only an individual responsibility for us to do this, there's a corporate responsibility. We have great opportunity to impact the faithfulness and the lives of other saints as we do this together. God has put people together so that we can continue to walk this road of discipleship more faithfully together, and we need one another. And that's part of the blessing of our rave groups and a great opportunity that uh, we, you have to do it. And notice it's exhort one another so that none of you will be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. And it's a great reminder of that first sin. The first sin really is the, the serpent lying in the garden. Well, you know, I know God said this, but let me tell you a different story. And it's a reminder that sin seems to always start with deceit, always with this false promise of what it can offer and what it is. And then it leads to hardness of heart. It, we begin to defend it and we, we stand there and proclaim, no, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. And so it's a great reminder that this is the process that's an unbelieving heart um, will lead us to fall away, and that falling away happens because of the deceitfulness of sin. These things really don't matter, right? What God said really doesn't matter, right? And so then we get to uh, 14 and 15, which is uh, a really sort of a, a great reminder for us and a, a good sort of check your identity, and it's it sort of akin to what we heard in verse 6. Um, so if you are in Christ, so we've come to partake in Christ, we've come to share in Christ in verse 14, if, and again, it's that conditional, if uh, we hold our original confidence firm to the end, if we hold on to the faith that we've been given. Um, throughout the New Testament, there's this, this call to stand firm in the truth that we've received. Uh, and if we hold it fast, and it's again a reminder of the undercurrents of our culture and the winds of, of uh, the things that get said, but also our call to hang on to the, the, sal the truth of salvation that we've been given. Uh, verse 15, you get a, a quick recap or a, a highlighting again of part of uh, Psalm 95. And then 16 through 17, 16, 17, and 18 really uh, is a, a staccato set of questions, leading questions toward a specific answer. Uh, real quick, questions four, five, and six are outstanding in that uh, seven through f 14 uh, consideration. I want to recommend all those to you and maybe even to question four add, uh, not only was it what it was it the issue in the Old Testament, the issue in the New Testament, but the, the same issue for us today. So 16 through 18, this uh, quick set of leading questions. Uh, that really sort of suggest, well, like, who was it that was done? And again, this is, uh, it speaks to them, but it speaks to us. Oftentimes, we we look at the Old Testament, and first we, we see two things. Either they didn't have the fullness of experience, so they need to be excused, or how on earth could they be that unfaithful when we would never do that? And that's really what the author is saying is, first, they knew, and second, they were unfaithful. And if they were unfaithful with all that they'd seen, what about us is really? And I want to sort of share a quote from uh, one of the commentators I'm looking at, uh, uh, Philip Hughes. Uh, he writes this, the point in verses 16, 17, and 18 uh, is that this generation, which had firsthand experience of the goodness of God in bringing them from slavery to freedom, compromised the very the very last group of, of people uh, would 
have been expected from to rebel against their savior God. And yet they did. And so we expand that. We now have been not only we've been we've received a greater uh, emancipation, not from slavery to uh, in Egypt, but to slavery to sin. And can we too then lose that? And one of the things that the author is is saying is that this was a choice. People chose hardness of heart. People chose rebellion. And so the root cause was unbelief. And so he's trying to unpack. Let's dive through that solemn example as it refers to Exodus 17. Let's pull it out and see that they chose, in spite of all the evidence, in spite of God's goodness, in spite of they really are self-excluding them from the promised rest that God has given them. And we're going to hear more about that promised rest next week. So once again, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for your leadership. Uh, I pray that these are blessings to you, and I'm praying for you and your group. Take care and God bless.